Well, good evening to each of you that have joined. And uh, before we begin, let's pray and ask God's blessings upon our study this uh, evening. Heavenly Father, thank you so much for this time that you have given us. And even now, as we are going to study your word, I pray that you may please continue to pour out your spirit upon us, give us understanding of what we are about to study, and also help us to apply that in our own personal lives. And uh, I pray and trust that you will, because we pray all this in the name of Jesus. Amen. We are in chapter 10 of the book of Daniel. And uh, wow, we've come a long way. And uh, we have two more chapters to go. Uh, but before we dive directly into the book of Daniel, uh, let's review some of the things that we have seen. Uh, actually, not so much of a review, but um, there will be some of that. But let me just give you a, a brief overview of what we are going to see in the next three chapters. You know, earlier on, when we um, began to study the book of Daniel, I mentioned that there are four major uh, parallel line of prophecies in the book of Daniel. You know, uh, notice the word that I used, parallel lines of prophecy in the book of Daniel, four major uh, parallel lines uh, of prophecies in the book of Daniel. Daniel chapter two is the first uh, major line of prophecy that we find with Babylon, uh, Babylon, Medo-Persia, Greece, and Rome represented by this uh, image uh, and then a stone that was cut out without human hands, which is the establishment of God's kingdom. And then we come to chapter seven, which is the second major parallel line of uh, prophecy in the book of Daniel. We see once again, Babylon, Medo-Persia, Greece, uh, pagan Rome, papal Rome, and then the uh, judgment scene in heaven. And uh, um, we see that was, symbolized, these kingdoms were symbolized by using different beasts and a little horn um, that was uh, employed in Daniel chapter 7 to symbolize these uh, different kingdoms. We come to chapter 8. We see that Babylon is not mentioned, Medo-Persia, Greece, pagan Rome, papal Rome, and the cleansing of the sanctuary uh, mentioned. We see the third major line of prophecy in the book of Daniel. Uh, in Daniel chapter 8, we once again see that uh, Medo-Persia was symbolized by, uh, by a ram with two horns, with one horn higher than the other. We see that uh, Greece was symbolized by a goat, and then a notable horn was uh, on the, uh, between the eyes of the goat, and then the notable, horn, the notable horn fell down, and then it sprouted four little, uh, four different horns. And then we see that there was a little horn uh, that comes up this scene uh, representing uh, pagan Rome and papal Rome. And then we see the cleansing of the sanctuary in Daniel chapter eight and verse 14. And we find the explanation, for, uh, particularly the timing for the 2300 days prophecy was mentioned in Daniel chapter nine. So those are the three major uh, line, parallel lines of prophecy that we studied so far. And beginning from chapter 10, all the way through chapter 12, uh, we see that the fourth and final um, uh, major line of prophecy of the book of Daniel is mentioned. The fourth and final major line of Daniel's prophecies are mentioned. And as we've always seen, as I've always mentioned, as also Samuel had mentioned, Bible prophecy uses this principle of repeat and enlarge, where the same line of prophecy is repeated and the information is enlarged each time it's repeated. And we see that same thing uh, being done in this fourth major line of prophecy that we find in chapters 10 through 12. And, you know, uh, chapter 10 uh, is a prologue to the final uh, uh, major line of prophecy of Daniel's prophecy. Chapter 11 is where we find the uh, prophecy, the final prophecy of Daniel mentioned. And uh, all the way leading through the uh, first four verses of the book of, uh, of the chapter 12 of Daniel. 
Okay, so Daniel chapter 10 is the pro prologue of the final uh, line of prophecy of which we'll be studying today. Um, chapter 11 and the first four verses of chapter 12 is where the prophecy is, the body of the prophecy, if you please. And um, the remaining portions of chapter 12 is the epilogue of this uh, final major prophecy of the fourth and the final major line of Daniel's prophecies. Daniel 10 happens to deal with a local issue that was taking place. Daniel 11 happens to uh, begin from the time of the prophet from the Medo-Persian Empire, all the way leading to the end of time, uh, which flows into chapter 12, where God establishes his eternal kingdom. So those are the three chapters uh, in this um, prophecy. And also, you know, when the Bible was written or when Daniel was written, th there was no chapter division until the 12th century. So really chapters 10, 11, and 12 um, is really the same thing. And there were no chapter divisions when it was uh, first written. And so chapters 10, 11, and 12 is all talking about this uh, same, um, uh, same major line of prophecy. And when you compare chapter 2, chapter 7, chapter 8, and chapters 10, 11, and 12, the fourth major line of prophecy is the more detailed uh, prophecy in the entire book of Daniel. I mean, there is so much detail that my friend is uh, planning to take um, two, uh, two parts for chapter 11. So it is very much detailed. Um, the fourth major line of prophecy. And also an important uh, point for us to notice is in chapters two, chapter seven and chapter eight, God used symbols, God used symbolism to represent these different kingdoms, to represent his um, prophetic message that he gave to his servant, uh, Daniel. But when you come to this final major line of prophecy, God does not use symbols in this one. He's very much direct with uh, the message that he wants to convey uh, in this final prophecy of Daniel. And unlike any other prophecy of Daniel, chapter 2 or chapter 7 or chapter 8, in this uh, final major line of prophecy, Jesus himself appears in the prologue, uh, which we will see. Uh, you know, it, is, it is called as a theophany in the theological circles, which refers to the appearance of God. And we will uh, look at that this uh, evening. We'll look at that this evening. And so I hope that um, you understood the big picture of uh, what we're going to study. Chapter 10 is the prologue and which deals with the local issue in the time of Daniel. Chapter 11 contains the body of the prophecy, uh, starting from the middle, uh, particularly the Persian Empire, all the way leading to the end of time, which flows into chapter 12, verses 1 through 4. And then finally, we see the epilogue of this major line of prophecy with the rest of the verses in chapter 12. So that is the uh, outline that we see for this uh, final major line of prophecy. And so let's look at chapter 10, which is the prologue. Chapter 11 will be done in two parts by my friend Dam, not Daniel, uh, Samuel, and then... Uh, and then I will be doing chapter 12 to conclude and tie up what we want to uh, see in chapter 12. And so let's go to Daniel chapter 10. Daniel chapter 10 and verse 1. The Bible tells us, In the third year of Cyrus, king of Persia, a message was revealed to Daniel whose name was called Belshazzar. The message was true, but the appointed time was long. And he understood the message and had understanding of the vision. In the third year of Cyrus, king of Persia, which year was that? That was 536, 535 BC. 536, 535 BC. I told you earlier about the, um, you know, how they calculated a year in, um, in their day and age you know they calculated from one spring to the other spring was one year you know what is uh well late march april late march april to the other late march april was one year so that's how they considered one year um for them 
So 536, 535 BC is the third year of Cyrus, king of Persia. And it is during this year that Daniel, being 88 years old, nearing his 90s, God has a message that he revealed to Daniel. It's amazing that how God, he spoke to a young Daniel there in Babylon. He was just 17 years old when he was taken to Babylon. And you know, he was around the age of 20 when Daniel interpreted uh, Daniel, uh, the vision or the dream the kingdom of God nature had, God spoke to Daniel as a young person. God spoke to Daniel as a middle-aged person. And God spoke to Daniel when he was in his old age. And you and I need to understand that God is interested in speaking to all classes of people and of different age groups. God is personal and he wants to help both the young person, the middle-aged person and the older person understand the prophecies of Daniel and Revelation and you know, actually the message of the entire Bible. God is able to relate with all age groups. I have often, uh, you know, I've often heard people in their middle age or old age mention, you know, Oh, I'm nearing the end of my life. There's not much to do. You young people have a lot of strength and energy. Well, there may be some truth to it. You know, God is not really done just because uh, somebody is old aged. You know, God wants to speak. He has a purpose, although you may be middle aged or old aged. And so that is something for um us to understand. But anyway, Daniel was 88 years old, 536, 535 BC, third year of King uh, Cyrus of Persia. God reveals a message to Daniel. And that is the message that we find in chapters 12 and uh, one to four verses of chapter, uh, I mean, chapter 11 and one to four verses of chapter 12. And so Daniel tells that this message was revealed to him and this message was true and the appointed time was long. In fact, the other translations, I'm reading from the New King James, but the other translations tell one of a great conflict, one of great conflict. And we will see why uh, Daniel mentions that this message was true and one of great conflict. And then he tells that he understood the message. There was no interpretation needed because God did not use symbolism. And so Daniel understood the message and he also had the understanding of the, um, of the vision. You know, one author, uh, he, he gives details as we read verse one. And this is the detail that I will just read that to you. He writes, in the third year of Cyrus, king of Persia, which is 530, uh, 536, 535 BC, a thing was revealed unto Daniel, which is the explanation of Daniel chapter 11, verses two through uh, four whose name was called Belshazzar, and the thing that was the explanation or the message found in uh, Daniel chapter 11 and 12 was true, but the appointed time was long. Why was the appointed time long? Because the explanation, it covers the periods of Persia, Greece, imperial or pagan Rome, papal Rome uh, in two stages, and the close of probation, the time of trouble, and the final deliverance of God's people. I mean, that is a long time. That is a long time. And that is why Daniel mentions that the message revealed to him in chapters 11 and part of chapter 12, the message, the time appointed was very long because it covered such a long period of time, all the way starting from the time of the prophet in Persia, leading to the final deliverance of God's people. And it's amazing, my friends, how God, he reveals the future way before, long before it happens, long before it happens. And then it continues, and he continues saying, and he understood the thing that is the vision or the message uh, of uh, chapters 11 and 12 and had an understanding of the vision. The vision referring to the 2,300 days of Daniel 8, 14. And let's look at verse 3, Daniel chapter 10, verses 2 and 3. Then it tells, in those days, I, Daniel, was mourning for how many weeks? For three full weeks. How many days is that? It's 21 days. So Daniel was mourning for three full 
weeks and for 21 days. Also, I want you to notice that Daniel mentions that he was a mourning for three full weeks, or if you're reading from some of the versions, it, tell, it tells three whole weeks, you know, and that's very critical. We will see our, uh, it's a, it gives us an insight that we will see about that a little later on. So Daniel was mourning, uh, I mean, praying for 21 days for three full weeks. I ate no pleasant food, no meat or wine came into my mouth, nor did I anoint myself at all till three whole weeks were fulfilled. And so we see Daniel, he's praying. He's, just, he's not just praying. He's fasting and praying for three whole weeks or three full weeks. And uh, he is praying for two reasons. The immediate verse itself or verse um, two and three itself does not mention why Daniel was mourning while Daniel was praying. But the context tells us that one reason Daniel was fasting and praying because he wanted to understand more about the 2,300 days prophecy. Uh, and then reason number two, we will be able to understand that when we look at what was happening in the political world with King Cyrus and with the Jews uh, that, that were there who were in exile, but who left Babylon. And so there are two reasons why, Dan why Daniel was fasting and praying. Reason number one, he wanted to understand more about the vision. He wanted to understand more about the 2,300 days prophecy. The reason number two, he was mourning uh, because of what was happening with his own people in Jerusalem. And uh, we will see that as we go. Now, um, what is it that was happening? You know, the events of chapter 10, one author writes, transpired in the year 535 BC. At this point, Cyrus's decree had already been given and the first wave of Jews had returned to rebuild the temple. You know, in chapter nine, we see that Daniel was praying. Yesterday, we saw that. Daniel was praying. Why was he praying? The 70 years of the Babylonian captivity was soon, com was soon coming to an end. And then Daniel was confused if they were going to be there for a much longer time. And so Daniel, he's repenting on behalf of his people. He's praying on behalf of his people. And then he's asking God, what is going to happen to his people? And Daniel was praying. And so in Daniel chapter 9, we see that um, he was praying in regards to the deliverance of people for them to, and in fulfillment of Jeremiah's prophecy, for them to leave Babylon and go back to Jerusalem. And Cyrus, when he became king, uh, you know, he gave the first decree. I think uh, Samuel, my friend, must have mentioned there are three decrees that were given. Um, but the, the decree by Artaxerxes is what uh, begins the 70-week prophecy or the 2,300 days prophecy. But one of the first decrees that was given is by Cyrus. And this decree was given in 535 BC. And in this year, the first group of the Jews had returned back to rebuild the temple of Jerusalem that was in ruins. And so when Daniel was praying, he was not praying in chapter 10 for them to return back to Jerusalem because they had already been given the decree to return back to Jerusalem. Chapters 11 and 12 bear the same date as Daniel chapter 10 because it is the same continuation. And so what was it? that made Daniel mourn for his people? What was it that made Daniel to fast and pray and mourn for his people? Uh, this is why. If you go to the book of Ezra chapter one, we see that Cyrus, he gives the decree to let the Jews return to Jerusalem. A, he gives the decree to let the Jews return to uh, Jerusalem in uh, Yes, uh, in, in, to Jerusalem. And in Ezra chapter 2, we see the list of the people, those who returned back to Jerusalem. In Ezra chapter 3, we see how worship was being restored and the initial work to rebuild the uh, temple already began. But when you go to Ezra chapter 4, 
we see that there is resistance in building the temple in Jerusalem. And it is because of this resistance that Daniel is fasting, he's praying, he's mourning for three full weeks or for 21 days. I told you that there are two reasons why Daniel was fasting and praying. Reason number one, he wanted to understand more about what was going to happen at the end of 2300 days. And then the reason number two is he was quite disturbed with what was happening while his people were rebuilding or attempting to rebuild the Jerusalem temple. Ezra chapter four. And uh, starting from verses one, one through five. Ezra chapter four, verses one through five. I also want you to understand that Cyrus had already given the decree for the Jews to return to Jerusalem and to rebuild the temple. And so the first group of the Jews have returned back to Jerusalem. They started rebuilding the temple. And to a certain and to a certain extent, Jerusalem and the Jews were still under the control of the Persian Empire. Okay. It was not until Artaxerxes came into the picture that he gives full. Um, autonomy for the uh, for the Jewish nation. Okay, until then, to a certain extent, there was uh, still control of the Jewish nation with the Persian Empire. And so, having that said, starting from uh, verse one of chapter four of Ezra, we find the following verses. Now, when the adversaries of Judah, the enemies of Judah and Benjamin, heard that the children of captivity builded the temple on to the Lord God of Israel. Then they came to Zerubbabel. Zerubbabel was one of the chief officers in leading the children of uh, Israel from the Babylonian captivity and back to Jerusalem and in rebuilding the Jerusalem temple. Okay. Then they came to Zerubbabel and to the chief of the fathers and said unto them, let us build with you. you know these Enemies of God's people, they're saying, you know, we'll come and help you. We'll come and help you build this temple. For we seek your God. Notice it tells, for we seek your God as ye do, and we do sacrifice unto him since the days of Isarhaddon, king of Asher, which brought us up hither. Notice verse 3. This is where the tension rises. But Zerubbabel and Jeshua and the rest of the chief of the fathers of Israel, of Israel said unto them, Ye have nothing to do with us to build an house unto our God. But we ourselves together will build unto the Lord God of Israel, as King Cyrus, the king of Persia, hath commanded us. Verse 4. Then the people of the land weakened the hand of the people of Judah and troubled them in building. So what happens here is Cyrus gives the decree for them to return back to Jerusalem and to rebuild the Jerusalem temple. And as they are rebuilding the Jerusalem temple, this group of people called the Samaritans, the adversaries or the enemies of uh, you know, God's people, they come and then they tell, you know, come, we'll build with you. We will uh, help you build this temple. And Zerubbabel and the fathers in Jeshua, they remembered. It is because that they joined with the heathens. It is because the worship was God. The worship of God was thrown down and paganism was brought into the sanctuary of God. One of the reasons why they were taken into captivity. And so they remembered the history of their own people. And they said, we don't want anything to do with you. We want to serve our own God. We don't want to incorporate um, the heathens in building because the heathens will influence them to bring in sacrifices to their own gods made of idols and gold and silver. So they did not want that to happen once again. They did not want the reason for captivity to happen once again. So Zerubbabel, Joshua, and the chief fathers, they say, you know, don't trouble us. According to the command that was given by King Cyrus, we're going to build the temple ourselves. And then we see when, uh, when they told that to their enemies, the people of the land, the Bible tells, it, they weakened the hands, they weakened the hands of the 
people of Judah and troubled them in building. You know, they gave them trouble. They gave trouble to Daniel's people, to the Jews in rebuilding the Jerusalem temple. And then we find in verse 5, and hired counselors against them to frustrate their purpose all the days of to send false reports to the courts of Persia, to King Cyrus, and that King Cyrus may revoke uh, the command that they gave, the decree that they gave to rebuild the Jerusalem temple. Now, who were these Samaritans? Dr. William Shea, he writes the following. He writes, the Samaritans came and wanted to help with the temple construction. They were the mixed descendants of those Israelites who had been left in the land after the Syrian and Babylonian uh, deportations and non-Jewish people who had been moved in from the east to occupy some of the old Israelite territory. They were polytheists and idolaters. The Jewish returnees, remembering the reason for their captivity, were afraid that the Samaritans would introduce these practices into the new temple. So they refused their offer to help with its reconstruction. That is where the problem arose. So, they rejected the offer of the Samaritans weekend to the people of Judah. And by false report, they aroused suspicion in minds easily led to suspect and for and so they sent false report to the um to the courts of uh persia when daniel learns about this daniel is thinking is god's temple is god's sanctuary is that going to be halted in its reconstruction what is going to happen to my people? What is going to happen to the sanctuary of my God? What is going to happen to this glorious temple that God initially had Moses to build and then Solomon built? And now the third time in Zerubbabel, under the leadership of Zerubbabel, this temple was being built. When he saw that, when he heard about that, Daniel, he begins to pray. He begins to pray. And we find three important principles of prayer in chapter 10. Three important principles of prayer in chapter 10. We know in Daniel chapter 2, he prays to God. We know in Daniel chapter 6, I believe, uh, he prays to God in the lion's den, uh, the lion's den story. But once again, in Daniel chapter 10, he's praying. And we find three important principles of prayer. The first important principle of prayer that we find is intercessory prayer. Moses, we know he interceded for his people, for Israel in Exodus chapter 32, verses 32, 33. Jesus, he interceded for his disciples back then and for us. Now, in John chapter 17, we see that. Also, Romans chapter 8, verse 34, and Hebrews chapter 7 and verse 25, it tells that Christ, he is making intercession for us even now. Moses interceded. Jesus interceded. Paul, he exhorts uh, in 1 Timothy chapter 2 and verse 1 that we need to offer supplication, intercession, and thanksgiving. Supplication, intercession, and thanksgiving. And let me tell you, my friends, there is power in intercessory prayer. And there are many, many times in my life that I have experienced the power of intercessory prayer. And one such in my, I mean, there are many other stories that I know of my uh, close friends and family that have experienced it. But one such story in my own personal life was earlier this year. And I was reflecting back upon this as I was preparing, um, you know, for Daniel chapter 10. Earlier this year, I... Uh, Okay, I want to be a little vulnerable here. I was earlier this time I was interested in someone and things did not go the way I wanted. And so it went a little south. And I remember being in a youth conference and, you know, I told 
some of my um, close people in my life and I told them what was going on. And, you know, I really had a little trouble to sleep uh, one night. And so the next day was really just horrible. And I told that to, to them. You know, they counseled me, they uh, worked me through it. And then they said, uh, we'll pray for you. So I remember going back to my room that evening and uh, I don't know, the previous night, it was very, very hard for me to fall asleep. You know, I was, I was thinking and whatnot. And uh, that very night I slept so peacefully it was so peaceful. And then I woke up the next day and, you know, I felt as though there was no heartbreak. I felt as though I was totally fine and nothing happened. And there was just joy in my heart. There was happiness in my heart. And then I told that um, uh, to the people that were praying for me. Uh, and they said that we've been praying for you the previous night. And I knew at that moment that it was the peace that passeth all understanding through the intercession of three of my close people in my life, that God gave me this peace. God gave me this healing that I needed. And I, I could just see the change in my mood, in my attitude, and how things went about. And I was able to face um, uh, things that I could not before, the power of intercessory prayer. Now, maybe there is a sick person in your family. Maybe you have a teenage doctor or son that is going through a tough time that needs your prayers. Maybe your parents, they need intercessory prayer. Maybe your co-workers, they need intercessory prayer. And my friends, intercessory prayer works. It worked in the life of Daniel, as we will see. And it worked for me. And it can work for anyone. And you know, sometimes when we are going through tough times, it will be hard for us to really think through and tell God what we really want to tell and express our heart. But when others are praying for us, you know, they're able to pray with more clarity and God answers their, answers their prayer, including ours. And, you know, I also learned this principle of intercessory prayer from one of my mentors. You know, sometimes when we pray for people those who don't believe in Jesus and people those who don't believe the Bible and the truths of the Bible, we sometimes wonder if that makes any difference at all. But intercessory prayer works even in that instance. I've seen that. I've seen that in my own family. Because when a person, he does not recognize God, when he does not read the Bible, or when he does not pray to God, that person is obviously not communicating to God and not respecting God to a certain extent. And so God does not force his will. God does not force his ways on any of them. And so obviously God is kind of not able to help them because God respects their freedom of choice in them not choosing him. But when we pray to God for that unbelieving son or daughter, when we pray to God for that unbelieving parent or child, when we pray to God for that unbelieving co-worker or relative, God, in respect to our prayers, will work in their life. I hope I made that clear. You know, when a person is an unbeliever, that person does not have regard for God. They do not think about God. They don't care about praying to God. And so God is kind of limited because he respects their freedom of choice and Satan takes control of them. But when we as believers pray for those unbelieving people, God in respect to our prayers will work on our behalf in their life. That is the power of intercessory prayer. Principle, prayer principle number two, is persistent. You know? Another parable uh, where Jesus illustrates the principle of persistence prayer. We need to be persistent in praying. I remember when I first wanted a laptop, <laughs> I was asking my dad so much. I mean, I was like, dad, can you please buy me a laptop? And then my dad would say, you know, you finish your 10th standard or 10th grade and I will get you a laptop. And I said, okay, all right, fine. And so I would go to church and there'll be people operating laptops and I'll be like, 
that do you see all the cool stuff that they do with the laptop? I mean, they can make PowerPoint presentations. They can type out documents and print stuff and they can save stuff. It's just cool. And then I was like, okay, okay, fine. Uh, I will get you a laptop. And so all of a sudden, uh, actually uh, 11 years ago this December, uh, I remember uh, my friend, my age, actually Samuel, he had this little laptop that he had. And so I went home from that youth conference and I told my dad, this guy my age, I mean, he has a laptop and he's doing all this amazing cool stuff. Can you please get me a laptop? Persistence. And how many times, my friends, we are persistent in asking for earthly things. We need to be persistent like Daniel in praying for our spirituality of our life. We need to be persistent like Daniel, praying for our parents, for our kids, for our relatives, for our friends. And then we see that persistent, being persistent in prayer has its reward. So prayer principle number one is intercessory prayer. Prayer principle number two is persistence in prayer. Prayer principle number three is fasting and praying. Priority of prayer. You know, Daniel prioritized prayer among his uh, daily necessities. You know, he did not eat pleasant food and drink and even did not anoint himself. That shows the priority that Daniel had towards prayer, praying for his people. He had a burden for the work that was going on in Jerusalem. We just got through verses one, two, and three. Let's jump to verses four through nine. The Bible tells, now on the 24th day of the first month, that is at the end of these three weeks, at the end of uh, 21 days. As I was by the side of the river, that is the Tigris, I lifted mine eyes and looked, and behold, a certain man clothed in linen, whose waist was girded with the gold of Uphaz, his body like beryl, bronze in her and the size of a multitude. I mean, Daniel, he's, he's looking for words and descriptions to, to describe what he's seeing, the appearance of this being that he's seeing. And I, Daniel, verse 7, alone saw the vision for the men who were with me did not see the vision, but a great terror fell upon um, uh, great terror fell upon them so that they fled to hide themselves. Verse 8, therefore I was left alone when I saw this great vision and no strength remained in me for my vigor was turned to frailty in me and I retained no strength. Yet I heard the sound of his words and while I heard the sound of his words I was in deep sleep on my face with my face to the ground. So we see Daniel He's standing by the river Tigris. Probably he was taking his morning or evening walk. We don't know. But uh, by the river, uh, by the riverside. But he was by the riverside on the 24th day of the first month or after the end of the three weeks. And we see that, uh, or after fasting and praying, and we see that this being appears. Now, before we see who this being appears, I told you that there's a little insight that we find uh, when Daniel tells that I was praying for three full weeks or for three whole weeks. You know, each full week, it ends on the seventh day or Saturday or the Sabbath day. This means that the final prophecy of Daniel was given to him on the Sabbath day. Because, you know, the, for the vision that he sees, it comes at the end of three full weeks. Which means it was on a Saturday that Daniel has this vision. Could it be that Saturday, the Sabbath day, is a very special day that was relevant not only for John the Revelator when he said, I was in the spirit on the Lord's day. And that was after the crucifixion of Jesus, John still recognized the Sabbath day as the Lord's day. And he said that Sabbath, the seventh day Sabbath is relevant 
even in the 21st century. But going on, when you compare the description of this being that Daniel sees, no, Daniel, he describes three things. He describes the clothing of this being. He describes the bodily features of the being. And he describes the speech of this um, being. When you compare that with the vision that John had, we see that it is talking about Jesus Christ. You come to Revelation chapter 1, verses 12 through 17. Revelation chapter 1, verses 12 through 17, the Bible tells the following. It tells... Then I turned to see the voice that spoke with me. And having turned, I saw seven golden lampstands. And in the midst of the seven lampstands, one like the son of man. Who is the son of man? Jesus Christ. Uh, clothed with the garment down to the feet. Daniel saw he was clothed in linen. And girded about the chest with a golden band. We see the same thing. Um, that Daniel sees. His hair and his head and hair were white like wool, as white as snow, and his eyes like the flames of fire. Same thing like Daniel saw. His feet like fine brass, similar to what Daniel saw, as if refined in a furnace, and his voice as the sound of many waters. And he had in his right hand seven stars, excuse me, and out of his mouth went a sharp two-edged sword, and his countenance was like the sun shining in its strength, similar to what Daniel saw. Verse 17 of uh, Revelation chapter 1. And when I saw him, I fell at his feet as dead. Similar experience as Daniel. But he laid his right hand on me. Similar experience as Daniel, saying to me, do not be afraid. Similar words found in Daniel. I am the first and the last. So the appearance of this being is the appearance of Jesus himself that also came to John the Revelator. What an honor it was. The God that Daniel was faithful to, the God that Daniel was faithful throughout his lifetime from his childhood until this very old age, appeared to Daniel at his old age. It probably gave assurance to Daniel that God was going to be with his people then and he will be with his people in the latter days. Because this talks about you and me also. You now you and I are spiritual Israel because we believe Jesus who came in the lineage of Abraham and David. You and I are spiritual Israel and God in Daniel chapters 10, 11, and 12, is talking about Daniel's people, people in the latter days, referring to you and me. And Daniel was being assured by God that he was going to be with his people then, and he will be with us even now. Even now. You know, I told you that uh, there are similarities between the vision that uh, Daniel received on the Sabbath day with the appearance of the Son of Man and that John received in his vision on the Lord's day. You know, both of them saw the appearance of Jesus. Both of them received uh, visions on the Sabbath day. Both of them, John and Daniel, they were elderly. Uh, both of them were exiles, you know, uh, Daniel was an exile in Babylon and John was an exile in the island of Patmos. And not just them, the messages of Daniel and Revelation, they go hand in hand. Both of them received apocalyptic prophecy, which narrates history down to its end and the setting up of God's kingdom. And let me tell you, my friends, when we understand the books of Daniel and Revelation, there will be a revival among God's people in the end time, a revival of true godliness, because we will realize not only that we are living in the end of time, but we will also see what it means and what it will take for us to be faithful to God until the very end when Jesus comes. Not only Daniel and uh, John had similarities, but the, their messages also, they go very much hand in hand. You know, as we come to the end of the book of Daniel, almost to the end of the book of Daniel, I would encourage you go back and study the books of Daniel and then study the book of 
a revelation. And let me tell you, my friends, Daniel, he mourned for three weeks to understand furthermore in relation to the 2300 days prophecy. And that is an example to you and me of how you and I are supposed to be on our knees in this, in this time of the end and ask God to help us understand the books of Daniel and Revelation and to inspire within us a revival such as that was never seen before, that this may not just stay with us, but that we may tell our friends and family. Daniel is an example of what we ought to do in the presence of God, asking us for more understanding, for a deeper relationship with him in the end time that you and I find ourselves in. But commenting on the appearance or known as the theophany in you know, theological circles, the appearance of God is known as a theophany. In regards to this, Dr. William Shea, I like really what he mentioned. You know, I've thought about this before, but I really like how he, how he put it together. He writes, this should give us a sense, you know, that is the description of Daniel about, I mean, description of God uh, through the pen of Daniel should give us a sense of the might, majesty, and the glory of God. There are two contrasting elements in religion that teaches us how we should approach God and how we should view him. These two elements are transcendence and immanence. Okay, transcendence and immanence. Excuse me if my, if my pronunciation is not right for the immanence part. But the transcendence of God says that he is great and mighty and glorious and that he runs the universe from his throne. The immanence of God tells us that he is our friend who has come down to dwell beside us. How can both of these views be true? How can the great majestic God of the universe also took low, uh, stoop low to become our personal friend? That is the great ultimately resolve in the incarnation. Jesus came to live alongside of us with his divinity shielded from us by his humanity. Thus, the great God of the universe becomes our personal friend in Jesus Christ. And in that capacity, he has a tender, loving concern for us. The transcendence and the immanence of God. God who is so big, God who is glorious and majestic, yet through incarnation, through Jesus Christ, we see how he comes along to our side and is our friend. Is this great God, this mighty God, is not only able to do big things for us, powerful things for us, but he's also able to sympathize with us. He's also able to fight the battles that we need to fight in our everyday life. When we go through tough times in our life, when we go through sickness, maybe when our friends or family go through sickness, maybe when we are struggling with the temptation, my friends, we can remember that God, who is not only our personal friend, God, who is not only able to relate with the temptations, with the suffering of humanity, but also he is a great God. He's a majestic God. He's a glorious God. He is all powerful. He is all wise. And then he is ever present. He is ever present. But carrying forward, Daniel chapter 10, verses 10 through 14. Suddenly a hand touched me, which made me tremble on my knees and on the palms of my hands. And he said to me, O oh, Daniel, man greatly beloved, this is uh, Gabriel, understand the words that I speak to you. You know, Gabriel came in chapter eight. He comes in chapter nine. He once again comes in um, chapter 10. And then we're continuing with verse 11. It tells, while he was speaking, actually, let me start all the way from chapter 10. I mean, verse 11. He tells, and he said to me, O oh, Daniel, man greatly beloved, understand the words that I speak to you and stand upright, for I have now been sent to you. 
while he was speaking this word to me, I stood trembling. I mean, when Daniel sees this vision or when he sees the appearance of Jesus Christ, I mean, he, fa- he just falls. And then there's no strength that was remaining in Daniel. No strength remaining in Daniel. Similar experience as John. But then Gabriel, he asks Daniel to stand and then he stands trembling. Verse 12, it tells, then he said to me, do not fear, Daniel. Same message to John, right? For from the first day that you set your heart to understand and to humble yourself before your God, your words were heard. And I have come because of your words. My friends, here we see the behind the scenes to our prayer life. Here we see the screen that is open. Here we see what is going on behind the scenes when we are praying. We see, my friends, that when Daniel begins to pray, the very first day of three weeks, that Jesus, uh, uh, that, that Gabriel appears now. I mean, eventually Jesus appears and then Gabriel appears and Gabriel tells Daniel, from the very first day, your prayers were heard. And I have now come to give an answer to your prayers. Another principle of prayer. Sometimes when we pray, there is immediate answer like we see in chapter 9. But in chapter 10, there are some times when we pray. There is a delay. That doesn't mean that God did not hear your prayers. My friends, keep praying, keep fasting, keep expressing your burdens to God, keep expressing your thanksgiving to God, keep expressing your pain to God, keep expressing your sorrows to God. Your prayers are being heard. And Angel Gabriel, here we see, tells Daniel from the very first day that you set your heart to understand and humble yourself before God. Your words were heard, and I have come in response to your prayers. What was it that delayed? Gabriel, verse 13, but the prince of the kingdom of Persia withstood me 21 days, three weeks, same time period. And behold, Michael, one of the chief princes came to help me for I had been left alone there with the kings of Persia. Let's identify who the prince of Persia, of the kingdom of Persia is. And then Michael, one of the chief princes, okay? Let's understand these two, who these two princes are, and then we can see what message um, we are able to find. And before that, let's read verse 14. Gabriel continues and he tells, Now I have come to make you understand what will happen to your people in the latter days, for the vision refers to many days yet to come. And so, my friends, the vision that Daniel gets or the message that Daniel gets in chapter 11 and part of 12, Yes, it begins from the time of Daniel, but it very much relates to your time and to my time. And so it demands our attention. It is worthy of our attention. But who is uh, the king of Persia? I mean, the prince of Persia and Prince Michael. And, uh, you know, I told you there are two reasons why Daniel was praying. Reason number one, he wanted to understand. He wanted to understand what was going to happen to God's people in relation to the 2300 days prophecy. What is going to happen to God's people after the 2300 days prophecy? Chapters 11, or the message that he receives is an answer to that. And now we see reason number two. uh, Reason number two uh, that Daniel was praying is because of the reconstruction of the temple that was halted because of these false reports carried by the Samaritans to the courts of Persia. And we see what happens in relation to that. We will see it right now when we understand the Prince of Persia and who the Michael is. Now, who is Prince of Persia who opposed Gabriel for 21 days? First of all, he must be a supernatural being to oppose angel Gabriel himself. Okay, he should be a supernatural being because one angel is so powerful that that one angel can kill like armies. So just one king, he's not, he's not that big for angel Gabriel. So for someone to oppose angel Gabriel, he must be a supernatural being. Number two, there is a difference. You know, if you notice the, um, 
if you if you notice the book of Daniel, uh, chapter ten, when he mentions that he was being withstood uh, by the prince of Persia, then he also mentions the king of Persia. There is a difference between the king of Persia and the prince of Persia, okay? So it is not talking about Cyrus, okay? The person that withstood angel Gabriel is not talking about Cyrus. He's a supernatural being, and then it must be, it is not Cyrus, it is someone else. Number three, he is an opponent to angel Gabriel. I mean, angel Gabriel, he's coming from heaven. He is God's messenger. So if someone is opposing angel Gabriel, it must be uh, someone who opposes God and heavenly truth. We find three times that Jesus mentions Satan as the prince of this world, as the prince of this world. My friends, we see here this mighty struggle that happens between angel Gabriel and Satan himself, and Satan himself. Who is Michael? Well, this is the first time in chapter, in the entire Bible that Michael appears in the Bible. And you know, in chapter 10 is the first time the name Michael appears in the Bible. And it is mentioned five times totally in the Bible. Okay, Of the five times, three times the name Michael is mentioned in Daniel, three times twice in chapter 10 and once in chapter 12. Uh, twice at the beginning of this major prophecy and once at the end of this major line of prophecy. Who is Michael? Michael, first of all, means one who is like God. Also in Jude, there's only one chapter, so Jude chapter one and verse nine, Michael is referred to as the archangel or the archangel, however you want to pronounce it, and in 1 Thessalonians chapter 4 and verse 16, Paul writes that Jesus will come with the sound of an archangel. And so Michael, it really, it refers to Jesus Christ. And then it tells in Revelation chapter 12 and verse 7 that Michael defeated Satan in heaven and threw him out of heaven. And so when angel Gabriel, and also before I, uh, you know, tie it all together, uh, Jesus' title, one of Jesus' title is Michael. And it is always used in the context when Christ is in direct conflict with Satan. You know, in heaven, we see in Revelation chapter 12, Michael or Jesus Christ was engaging in this conflict with Satan. Michael was used. Once again, Jude chapter 1 and verse 9, uh, when Satan came to claim the body of Moses, we see Jesus himself came and he contended with Satan. Michael was used to refer to Jesus. We see when Jesus comes the second time to overthrow the powers of evil and to overthrow Satan and his kingdom, we see Michael is being used in 1 Thessalonians. And once again, we find in Daniel, when Satan is opposing angel Gabriel, Michael, Jesus Christ is once again uh, being referred to as Michael in direct conflict with Satan. And so what was happening? What was happening for these 21 days? Because heaven listened to Daniel's prayer from the time Daniel began to pray, but it took 21 days. It took 21 days for angel Gabriel to come to Daniel. Why? Because Satan was opposing angel Gabriel and then Jesus Christ had to come to the rescue. But what was happening in the mind of this Persian king? Notice uh, what this one author writes. While Satan was striving to influence the highest powers in the kingdom of Medo-Persia Medo to show disfavor to God's people, that is, you know, for the Jerusalem temple to be, uh, reconstruction of the Jerusalem temple to be halted, angels worked in behalf of the exiles. The controversy that is between angel Gabriel, uh, Michael, and Satan and his angels, the controversy was one in which all heaven was interested. Through the prophet Daniel, we are given a glimpse of this mighty struggle between the forces of good and the forces of evil. For three weeks, Gabriel wrestled with the powers of darkness, seeking to counteract the influences at work on the mind of Cyrus. 
while Satan was using the Samaritans and his evil angels and the false counselors to influence Cyrus's mind to rebuild, to rebuild Jerusalem. Give of darkness. Christ himself came to Gabriel's aid. The prince of the kingdom of Persia, which stood me for 21 days, Gabriel declared, but my chief came me and kings of Persia, all that heaven could do in behalf of the power gained, the forces of the enemy were all the days of Cyrus and all the days of Biases, seven and a half years. My prince, you are not in neutral or not in a neutral place. I was talking to my friend recently, encountered some unfortunate inst uh, circumstances. And you know, I told my friend, we are not, we are unfortunately on the other side of heaven. What does that mean? We are on battleground. And Revelation chapter 12 depicts this battle. This conflict between Christ and Satan. And my friends, let me tell you. Satan will use his agencies to influence your mind and my, my mind to win our allegiance and to win our faithfulness to his side. Worship is the ultimate expression of it. Receiving the mark of the beast is the ultimate expression of it. Disobeying God's commandment on Sabbath keeping is the ultimate expression of it. But first he will try to win our influence in little, little things, in small, small things, just like he was trying to influence Cyrus. But the good news is there is also Michael. There is also angels interested in helping us to be faithful to God interested in bringing us happiness, interested in giving us joy, interested in giving us strength in times of trouble, while Satan wants to destroy us, when Satan wants to make sin feel very um, filled with pleasure, and then eventually wants to destroy us, make us come to an end. There is God fighting on behalf of us. There is God listening to our prayers. There is God when we are struggling and striving to overcome a sin. There is Michael. There is Gabriel to help us when we are going through tough times in our family because of sickness, because of sorrow, because of poverty. There is God, Michael. There is angel listening to our prayers while Satan may try to almost win. There is Michael, our prince. There is Michael, your prince, who is powerful than Satan, who is powerful than all forces of evil. He is able to deliver you from the temptation. He is able to deliver you from that sin. He is able to deliver you from that sickness. This Michael, your prince, my prince, has the power, has the capacity to completely overthrow God says, Troy, and we will have deliverance. We will study that in the book of Revel uh, Daniel chapter 12. But in closing, Ephesians chapter 6, verses 10 through 18. Ephesians chapter 6, verses 10 through 18. It tells, finally, my brethren, be strong in the Lord. Did God tell Daniel be strong? Did God strengthen Daniel when he was weak? If you are sick, if your friends are sick, if your relatives are sick, if God was able to strengthen Daniel, he can strengthen you and me also. But Paul writes under the inspiration of God, finally, my brethren, be strong in the Lord and in the power of his might. Put on the whole armor of God that ye may be able to stand against the vials of the devil. We are on battleground. We are not on neutral ground. Verse 12, for we do not wrestle against flesh and blood, 
but against principalities, against powers, against the rulers of the darkness of this age, against spiritual hosts of wickedness in heavenly places. Our enemy is Satan. Our enemy is unholiness. Our enemy is disobedience to God's commandments. Our enemy is the devil. Verse 13, therefore, what does that word therefore mean? Because our battle is again, not against flesh and blood, but against spiritualities, but against principalities and against powers and against Satan. Therefore, take up the whole armor of God that he may be able to withstand in the evil day and having done all to stand. Verse 14, stand therefore, having girded with your waist with truth, having put on the breastplate of righteousness and having shod your feet with the preparation of the gospel of peace. Verse 16, above all, take the shield of faith with you, which you will be able to quench all the fiery darts of the wicked one. Verse 17, and take the helmet of salvation and the sword of the spirit, which is the word of God. Verse 18, pray, pray always. With all prayer and supplication in the spirit, being watchful to this end, with all perseverance and supplication for all the saints. Paul is writing. You and I are engaged in a warfare. And in this warfare, he asks us to put on the whole armor of God. You can... Later on, you can go and read and understand and study what that is. But I want to mention prayer. Praying always with all prayer and supplication in this being watchful to this end with all perseverance and supplication for all the saints. You know why, my friends? When Daniel prayed, heaven listened. When you pray, heaven listens. Daniel did not give up praying. We are not to give up praying because there's a conflict that's going on. While Satan may be trying to influence the bat for us, God is using his armies. Michael is using his armies to counteract the devil and to give you victory, whatever the problem might be. As we come to the end of Daniel chapter 1, verses 15 through 21, it tells, when he had spoken such words to me, I turned my face towards the ground and became speechless. And suddenly, one having like the likeness of the sons of men touched my lips. Then I opened my mouth and spoke, saying to him who stood before me, my Lord, because of the vision, my sorrows have overwhelmed me, and I have retained no strength. Verse 17, for how can this servant of my Lord talk with you, my Lord? As for me, no strength remains in me now, nor is any breath left in me. Verse 18, then again, the one having the likeness of a man touched me and strengthened me. And he said, O oh man, greatly beloved, fear not, peace to you strong. Yes, be strong. So when he spoke to me, I was strengthened and said that my Lord speak <coughs> for you have strengthened me. My friends, notice what the end of verse 20 and 21 tells. End of Daniel chapter 10 tells. Then he said, do you know why I have come to you? Now I must return to fight with the prince of Persia. And when I have gone forth, indeed, the prince of Greece will come. Now notice verse 21 as we end. But I will tell you what is noted in the scripture of truth. You know, Dan was praying for more understanding. Gabriel was to come back after he fights with the devil and give more understanding of the vision of the 2020 days prophecy as to what will happen in the latter days to God's or Daniel's people. Then it tells no one upholds me against these, except, notice the language, Michael, your prince. The language changes from Michael, one of the princes, to Michael, your prince. Are you fighting a warfare within your own heart? Maybe 
Is it a warfare between reason and feeling? Or is it a warfare with sickness in your own life or in your family? Is it a warfare with a particular sin? Is Satan trying to overpower you? Is he trying to destroy you? Friends, persevere in praying. My friends, Michael, your prince, is listening to your prayers. Michael, your prince, will give you the strength, will give you peace. He will strengthen when you are weak. He will peace when you are troubled. Michael, your prince, my prince, is able to deliver. He's powerful enough to deliver, and he will deliver us today. He will deliver us in the future. He will continue to deliver us as long as we are on our knees, asking God and being on God's side. Bless you. And I hope and pray, whatever battle you're going through, whatever battle your family or friends may be going through, remember there is Michael, your prince and my prince, who has won all of this on the cross of Calvary. God bless you.